weeks. I would appreciate if only half of you talked during my talk. So these have been a very intense two weeks. So I'm going to start the first few minutes of the talk summarizing what we have learned. And one thing I learned from my friend Steve Schenker is to try to summarize your knowledge in slogans. And the idea is that you have something very complicated. You try to squeeze it into one sentence, which is memorable, preferably one phrase, and which you kind of drill into your brain. And the rest are details. So I try to point out kind of a summary of the last two weeks in two sentences, which I think are really the highlights that need to be remembered. And the rest are details. So if I had to pick three topics, I will not do justice to all the speakers, but three catchphrases. The first is supersymmetry. That's obvious. That was the name of the school. So that's something important that needs to be remembered. So that's number one. Number two comes under many different names. And it was very important in almost all the talks you heard. Not all of them, but in almost all of them. And it comes under various names. I wrote here BPS slash holomorphy. It also comes under the name of chiral. Chiral quantities, chiral ring. This is an application of the same idea, which was not stressed in these lectures. But there's really no reason to stress it, because it's the same as the others. These are just synonymous things. And half supersymmetric. Half or quarter, etc. cetera, Susie. So this is number one. This is number two. All of them are synonymous. And the fact that in supersymmetric theories, which have objects which are so special, which are invariant under half, a quarter of the supersymmetry, is what really underlies most of the magic of supersymmetric theories. So if you want one thing that really underlies almost everything, this is it. And we've seen that in the non-renormalization theorem, where the superpotential was controlled. You have seen that in Witten's talks and the more advanced n equals 2 talks, where the prepotential and spectrum of some particle masses of this masses of some particles in the spectrum were controlled. It's the same idea. We have seen that in Nima's talk, where this is the property which underlies the solution of the hierarchy problem. So all of these things are different aspects of the same thing. And the third aspect of the school, so this is number one, number two, and the next as aspect is duality. And this is really something which is widely believed to be much broader than supersymmetry. But since we have power due to these BPS things, or holomorphy, et cetera, et cetera, we can explore it in some circumstances. And the main lesson, from my perspective, that we learned out of supersymmetry is the fact that duality is ubiquitous. We have seen that in n equals 2 theories, where there's a theory at short distance, there's a theory at long distance. There are two notions of duality there. One is the duality between the short distance theory and the long distance theory. And the second notion of duality is that we have electric magnetic duality acting within the low energy theory. And Greg Moore gave us a beautiful presentation, which is manifestly duality symmetric, where all the duality frames are on equal footing. The n equals 4 theory, which was discussed by some speakers here, is even more beautiful because it has more duality. Uh, we have strong weak duality. We've seen that also in Gaiotto's talks. Again, the same duality. And we saw it in Maldacena's talks when he talked about a different kind of duality, where the n equals 4 theory on one hand is dual to some gravitational theory. And what I'll do today is present another kind of duality, which I'll talk about later. So if we want to summarize the school, this blackboard is the summary of the school. And this is something that even people with memory deficiency can remember. <laughs> memory challenged, I should say. Another aspect of supersymmetry which has not been stressed is the fact that we have different number of supersymmetries. So I saw a beautiful plot 
which if the recording is turned off, I will later tell you my view of it on the Bloomberg Hall. <laughs> Blackboard thinks as a function of the number of supersymmetries. There was one problem with that. Well, there were many problems with this plot, which I will explain if the recording is turned off, or maybe after the talks. But one major problem is that you should really classify things as a function of the number of supersymmetries. So Jeffery's talk was classified under n equals 6. But in fact, it should be on that plot be in n equals 3, because the counting was the four-dimensional counting. <laughs> no, this is not a joke. This is. Because, well, the plot I'll explain later. We'll turn off the recording. I'll explain the plot and my interpretation of the plot. And, and I can assure you it will be much more interesting than my talk. <laughs> so one thing that should have been obvious from that plot is that as we have more, so and should also be obvious from these slogans, is that if we have, as we have more supersymmetry, we have more power because we have more handles. And the more power we have means two things. Number one, we can calculate more. Objects are far more constrained, and since they're more constrained, we can calculate more of them. The problem with that is that this is typical in physics. The more you can calculate, the less interesting is the result. Because in order to get rich phenomena like life, for example, you should not better have no integrability, no supersymmetry, and so forth. All these beautiful things which help you calculate really ruin the richness in the answer. The hydrogen atom and the harmonic oscillator are beautiful, but they're very degenerate systems. If, on the other hand, you go to other systems like complicated molecules and you want to form DNA and so forth, they are not integrable. You cannot calculate, but they really lead to the richness of science. So given that, we should really go down in the number of supersymmetries and try and find, this is again something we always do in physics, trying to find the model or the example which is the most, the richest one possible, and on the other hand, sufficiently calculable so that we can say something meaningful about it. And this is always kind of tension in physics. On one hand, we want to calculate in a reliable fashion, and on the other hand, we, need the, we want the answer to be interesting. So, as we go down in the number of supersymmetries, the dynamical phenomena become richer and richer. In n equals 8, we did not discuss any dynamics. We just talked about some classical configuration. In n equals 4, there's a beautiful story about s-duality, tau goes to minus 1 over tau. And there's even another kind of interesting twist, which gives us the real ADS-CFT, which is extremely deep. But as we go down in supersymmetry, the phenomena become more interesting. In the context of n equals 2, we have heard three different speakers here showing rich phenomena. More can be calculated. The coupling constant depends on where you are on the moduli space, various things which are not true in n equals 4. And we can even go down to n equals 1, where I'll do some of that today. But we've also seen on the ADS-CFT side, or in the gravity dual side, we've seen in Klebanov's talk, where as we go down in the number of supersymmetries, the phenomena become more and more interesting. So the general framework is the same, but you get much more, much richer phenomena. So our goal, therefore, today is to go down in supersymmetry as little as possible supersymmetry so that we can still calculate, hoping to find interesting physics. And logically, what I'll do today really belongs in the first week of the school, but for various technical reasons, I was put last. OK, so the topic of today's talk is SUSY QCD. So the title of my talk, which was assigned to me by the organizers, was SUSY Gauge Dynamics. And so far, in the first two talks I gave, I did not say the word gauge. In fact, I went out of my way not to use the word gauge. I did say a few things about gauge, theor gauge theories and supersymmetric gauge theories in my discussion session. And I used the opportunity that people ask questions to get some of the story in. I assume that all of you were there so that I, everything I said is understood. So there is a benchmark model, which is the simplest one to study, which is SUNC 
gauge theory with quarks. Quarks. Quarks Q and anti quarks. which I'll denote by Q tilde. I don't like to put the bar on it because it's not the complex conjugate. Nima likes to put a superscript C. I like to put a tilde. I think bar is something which would really be uh, disallowed because it's always very, very confusing what you mean by bar. So bar is, for me, is the complex conjugate. Q tilde is not the complex conjugate of Q. It's another chiral superfield which a priori has nothing to do with Q. This is in the fundamental representation. And this is in the anti-fundamental representation, where here the bar does mean complex conjugate as it should. So this is the benchmark model. Another matter representation was considered in the various n equals 2 talks, where we threw in a matter field in the adjoint representation. I'm not going to do it here. In fact, I want to study this theory. What do we know about this theory? Well, we know quite a lot. And I used to give talks in schools where I would give four, five, six lectures only about this theory, and I would try to squeeze only the highlights to one lecture here, and you can read more details if you want in the two reviews I referred you to, and there are links to them on the school website. So one thing I emphasized in my talk, and I think Witten also emphasized in his talk, if you want to understand the quantum theory, the first thing you should do is study the classical theory. The classical approximation is bad in some cases, but it's not that bad. And if you don't understand the classical approximation, don't even start thinking about the quantum theory. So what do we know in the classical theory? There's a potential. And the potential is proportional to the sum of the gauge generators, dA squared, and every dA is sum over the generators. And here we have Q. OK, now I have to be careful with the notation. So I'll write it like that. Trace Q, T, A, Q, dagger, minus Q tilde, T, A. And here we need the star. And here I'll put a Q tilde transpose, and that's square and summed over A. So the Qs are rectangular matrices. In one direction, we have the colors. In the other direction, we have the flavors, the indices labeling the flavors. The TAs are the generators of the gauge group, in our case, SUN. And here we contract the color indices, so you see that the indices of the labeling the different columns are contracted here, and this is Q dagger doing the same. This trace traces over the remaining indices of this now square matrix, which are the flavor indices. And the same thing is true here. The relative minus sign between this and that is because the Q tildes are in the complex conjugate representation of Q. And hopefully this notation is clear. So the first question regarding the classical theory is what is the ground state? What are the ground states? So the ground state is determined very easily the sum of positive, sorry, sum of non-negative quantities, sum of squares. So the ground state is when all of them vanish. So classical ground states ground states of vacua are all the DAs vanish. And this is a huge modular space of vacua. I denote it by C because it's the classical modular space of vacua. And we talked a little bit about this modular space of vacua in my first talk. So we can solve these equations. Surprisingly, these, precisely these equations were considered and analyzed in a lot of detail by mathematicians. I think it was the 18th or the 19th century. Greg, when was it? So either 18th or 19th century, but even I wasn't born then. And we know a lot about it, and, but I'm not going to discuss it here. We're just important for us at the moment is just that there are many, many different ground states. This is one of the characteristic of supersymmetric theories. 
The ground state is not unique. Not only isn't it unique, there are manifolds of ground states. And not only that, that's something we have seen, there is no symmetry which relates them. So there are ground states which are classically inequivalent. This is unlike pion physics, where there's a family of ground states, some three-sphere or more complicated groups, but there's a symmetry which relates them. Here there is no symmetry which relates them. These are inequivalent ground states. And in quantum mechanics, such an accidental degeneracy, this is the term in the quantum mechanics books, accidental degeneracy, two levels which have exactly the same energy for no good reason. Such an accidental degeneracy is usually lifted once you perturb the system a little bit. It's unstable. Not true in, quant in supersymmetric theories. This accidental degeneracy is preserved. We had an example in the first or second lecture of what I call the pseudomodular space of vacua. There were ground states which were degenerate classically, and supersymmetry was broken. But once we included one loop corrections, a potential was developed on these ground states. Such a potential could be developed because supersymmetry was broken. Here, supersymmetry is unbroken, so all of these vacua are supersymmetric. All of these vacua are supersymmetric, and therefore, this degeneracy is not lifted to all orders in perturbation theory. So now comes an interesting question. What happens non-perturbatively? And all the fun in these theories is not to take this classical modular space of vacua and writing it in a hundred different ways. This is something you could do, but this is the warm-up exercise. What you're really interested in is ask, what does the quantum theory do? So the first question, before we get into complicated dynamics, we have to ask ourselves, is this vacuum degeneracy lifted or not? Is there a potential on the space of ground states? So we had some approximation, the classical approximation, where we found a modular space of vacuum. And then we have to ask ourselves, is this qualitative feature, forget quantitative things, quantitative things will change, but is the qualitative behavior that we have this degeneracy, does it persist in the quantum theory or not? And the first reaction would be, of course not, because this is an accidental degeneracy. But we've already seen that due to the non-renormalization theorem, that that's not true. So this vacuum degeneracy is not lifted to all orders in perturbation theory. Then, as physicists always move from one extreme to the other, well, if it's true to all orders in perturbation theory, it must be that the non-renormalization theorem is also true non-perturbatively. In fact, this was the prevailing point of view in the community uh, before you were born. So we'll see that this is not the case and the answer is more complicated. So as a preliminary for studying the quantum theory, we should, the answer turns out to depend on the number of flavors. So now we are moving to the quantum theory. And the first topic we will start with is the case without flavor. So now we have just the pure gauge theory. The pure gauge theory has classically a global U1R symmetry under which the gluinos are rotated by a phase. This is symmetry of the classical theory. And as I explained in the tutorial, the discussion, the homework session or whatever, this classical symmetry is anomalous and it is, and I emphasize, explicitly broken to a discrete Z, 2 and C R symmetry. So a theory which classically has a U1 R symmetry, quantum mechanically has only a discrete Z2 and C symmetry. And in the quantum theory, there is a lot of evidence, and in fact it can actually be proven, this discrete symmetry is spontaneously broken to a Z2. And this Z2 is a trivial Z2 symmetry, 
it's actually so trivial that it's actually part of the Lorentz group. This is the Z2, which is associated with two pi rotation around space-time, which means that all the fermions get a minus sign. We clearly do not want to break this symmetry. The order parameter for this breaking is the expectation value of gluinos by linear. And the answer with all the pi's is 1 over 32 pi square. So the right-hand side has dimension 3. The left-hand side has dimension 3. So this is one consistency condition. But I would like to make several comments about this formula. First of all, this formula is exact. I did not prove it here, but we know that this formula is exact. In fact, we even know what the coefficient is. In order to explain what I mean by that, we first have to define what we mean by lambda. So lambda is something that I explained a little bit in the discussion session. We have to formulate the quantum theory with a cutoff. Classically, the theory was scale invariant. There was no scale in the problem. So we have to formulate it with a cutoff. And now we have the phenomenon of dimensional transmutation, the same phenomenon which happens in QCD, which has led to a recent Nobel Prize. So in perturbation theory, a scale lambda is generated and it is e to the minus 8 pi square over 3 nc g square at the point of the cutoff. And as I emphasized in the discussion session, this is always much smaller than the cutoff. So this is what we mean by lambda. Now, we could be a little bit more precise. You, normally, when you study quantum field theory, you see the logarithm of this equation. It's not usually written this way, but the logarithm of this equation contains exactly the same information as this one. And the coefficient here is the one loop beta function. And the reason for the Nobel Prize was the sign here, that it's minus. That's actually a very, very important and deep sign. So just one more comment. You, there's an ambiguity here, how precisely we define the cutoff. And you and I might decide to define the cutoff slightly differently. Your cutoff might be a factor of four bigger than mine, a factor of seven smaller than mine. That would translate into a prefactor here, which goes together with various high order corrections in G. Changing this thing is known as a regularization scheme. Different people use different regularization schemes, and therefore their definition of lambda might be slightly different. For example, we can have dimensional regularization, we can have power levy laws, higher derivative, put it in the system on the lattice. All these regulators are perfectly good, and they differ by this multiplication. So when I say that we know here the coefficient, I, I can always define the coefficient to be 1, as long as it's non-zero. Somebody proves the coefficient is non-zero, we can always define lambda such that the coefficient is 1. But in fact, we know a little better than that. There is a preferred regularization scheme in this problem, which I'm not going to explain, but it comes under the name of dimensional re reduction bar. And in dimensional reduction bar, as opposed to dimensional reduction without the bar, it doesn't matter what it is, the coefficient is indeed 1. So this is a quite a success, because we have a well-defined regularization scheme. And in that well-defined regularization scheme, we know the precise answer, the precise non-perturbative answer for an expectation value of an operator in the theory. This is a very complicated problem, a non-linear problem, very quantum mechanical, and we know everything about this equation. So this is all I wanted to say about the pure gauge theory, but this is kind of boring. We computed one number. Oh, there was one more thing I wanted to say. I wrote, it, I wrote the formula this way. The 3 and c here is the same 3 and c that appears here. So it comes e to the minus 8 pi square over g square. But somebody could say this is a stupid way of writing the formula because we can just cancel the nc from here to here and get just lambda cube. Well, not quite. This object is completely well defined, lambda to the 3 and c. 
By raising it to a fractional power, we find nc different answers, answers which differ by a phase. Who can tell me what this phase signifies? Or why is it important? Very good, can you speak up? Right, the theory has nc vacua associated with this spontaneous breaking, and these three vacua, nc vacua, differ by a phase, the ex expectation value differ by a phase, and hence this answer. Okay, so now let's add matter. When we add matter, so we'll start when the number of flavors is less than the number of colors. So we have to solve this equation. Where did I write this equation? Ah, we want to set all these d's to zero. This is a simple question in algebra. And you can show either with the use of this fancy math, which I'm not going to describe, or just diagonalizing the matrices and so forth, that the solution of these equations, this is a bunch of algebraic equations, are <coughs> labeled by an expectation value of a matrix, which is Q tilde, Q transpose. Where here, I contracted the color indices between Q tilde and Q, but I did not contract the flavor indices. So this is a gauge invariant object, especially if we want to talk about precise quantities in quantum field theory. It's essential to talk about things which are well defined. This is another lesson you might want to take from the school. If you're making approximate statements, you can be a little bit imprecise. But if you try to make exact statements, you cannot even be a little bit imprecise because you will just get the completely wrong answer. So. If you want to make exact statements, you should really talk about objects which are rigorously well defined, and in this case, they should be at least gauge invariant. So this is an NF by NF matrix, which looks like a meson because it has anti-quark and a quark, and hence the letter M. So, so this, I just write it like that. So we have a ground a moduli space of vacua, parameterized by M, and we ask ourselves, is this degeneracy lifted? Since the, now we are just going to use the three rules that I had in lecture number one. What do we need to impose? We need to impose holomorphy, the symmetries, and various asymptotic behaviors. These are the three rules. So in order to lift the degeneracy on this space of M's, the light fields are the mesons M. We should write a superpotential, which would be a function of M, but because of holomorphy, no M bar, no M dagger. Only chiral superfields. Furthermore, we need to impose the various symmetries in the problem. It turns out that there is a unique answer. So there's a unique superpotential we can write down. This is the only object which satisfies our consistency conditions. This is the only object which is holomorphic, invariant under all the symmetries, and will soon impose the asymptotic behavior to see what it means. This is an enormous simplification, because here we have a very complicated quantum field theory, and we ask, is the degeneracy lifted? So the degeneracy is lifted if and only if a superpotential can be generated, because we want to give some potential, and if there is a potential, there has to be a superpotential. And there's only one thing we can write down, where this exponent here, 3nc minus an f, is the analog of this lambda to the 3nc, which appeared in the pure gauge theory. So this is the question. Is this thing generated or not? One thing we know for sure, nothing else can be generated. Why can't not, why, how am I? Why am I so sure that nothing else can be generated? Very good. Somebody here whispered the answer. Who was it? Very good. This is the only thing which is invariant under the symmetries. This is the only thing which is consistent with holomorphy. So this is the only thing that can be there. So the only thing that needs to be done is to check the coefficient here. There is a number here which needs to be computed. So I'm not going to do it here. This by itself is a matter of another lecture or two. 
But this number can be computed. And it turns out to be nc minus nf, where again, you could say, is it even meaningful to compute the number? First of all, it's meaningful to check whether the number is 0 or not. And if the number is non-zero, it's meaningful to compute it only once we specify what we really mean by lambda. And what we mean by lambda is always this celebrated regularization scheme, dimensional reduction bar, in which this is the coefficient. And this, is, this, this scheme is by far the simplest to use. But every other scheme is also good. So this is the answer. And this potential is generated. And it's a very long story, which I'm not going to explain here. The answer to the question, how is it generated, what's the physics underlying it, depends on how many flavors we have. For different number of flavors and colors, different physics is responsible for this thing. But it must always be the same functional form, because this is the only functional form which is consistent with our rules. So this is the superpotential. The superpotential is generated. But if we want to know what really happens, we need to understand the Kähler potential. What do we know of the Kähler potential? Well, near the origin of the modular space, the dynamics is very strongly coupled and very complicated. But that's not the case asymptotically, when m is very large and generic. So for generic m, going to infinity, we know what the Kähler potential. K is determined by classical physics. In fact, it's precisely the Kähler potential of the tree-level physics that we started with. We started with some tree-level physics, which had some quadratic Kähler potential and so forth. All we need to do is express it in terms of m. And the answer is approximately equal to 2 trace m dagger m to the 1 half. Notice that it's independent of lambda. It's independent of the gauge coupling g. And the reason is that this is the answer in the tree approximation. This is the answer we would get for g going to 0. So if we know the Kähler potential and we know the superpotential, the next thing to compute is the potential. And the potential of m looks roughly like this. So we started with a theory which classically had an infinite number of vacua, inequivalent vacua, a continuous infinity of vacua. Quantum mechanically, not only is the degeneracy lifted, we end up with no vacuum at all. This is a quantum field theory which does not have a ground state. Witten had a throwaway comment in his talk that even in the n equals 2 theory that he studied, your first thing you have to do is make sure that this does not happen. If you're so interested in, determin in determining the physics along the moduli space of vacua, the first thing you have to check is that there exists a moduli space of vacua. If there is no moduli space of vacua, there is nothing to compute. Well, there is something to compute, but not the spectrum of BPS states. There's not going to be any wall crossing and so forth. So here, for fewer flavors than colors, there was a classical degeneracy. It was preserved to all orders in perturbation theory, but it was not preserved non-perturbatively, and the theory has no ground state at all. This result might seem disappointing, but in fact, it's extremely interesting. It is interesting because we had this celebrated non-renormalization theorem telling us that if things the things don't happen, in various things don't happen quantum mechanically. In particular, the superpotential is not renormalized. Now we see that the non renormalization theorem, good as it is in perturbation theory, is not true non perturbatively. So this superpotential violates the non renormalization theorem. There's nothing wrong in the theorem because the theorem was proven within perturbation theory. But it's important to keep that in mind because it leaves open the possibility for having other interesting non-perturbative results. So this is what happens for fewer flavors than colors. Let's try and take this formula for more flavors. So when we have more flavors, 
this picture completely breaks down. And the first thing to do, and this is again a general rule in physics, you first try, try to do is check, will the solution of the previous problem also solve this problem? That's always the first thing to do. But it becomes interesting when the solution of the old problem does not solve the new problem, and we need a new solution. And physics has a tendency of telling us that we are doing something wrong. For example, I'm going to NF bigger or equal NC. If the number of flavors equals the number of colors, we said this is the only thing we can write down, but this expression doesn't make any sense because we have to raise it to an infinite power. Okay, so this formula doesn't even make sense as a formula. If the number of flavors is bigger than the number of colors, recall that M was defined as a Q tilde Q transpose. Q is a rectangular matrix which has NC colors and NF, sorry, NC columns and NF lie, uh, rows. So this M is a matrix which is, squ is a square matrix, but its rank is constrained. So the rank of the matrix M is less than or equal the number of colors. This is just a property of matrices. Take two column vectors and you multiply them. You can find a big matrix, but it has at most rank one. Now, if the number of flavors is bigger than the number of colors, <coughs> as in the case we we're interested in, then this matrix has rank, which is smaller than its size. And therefore, this determinant, which appears in the denominator, is zero. So again, this formula doesn't make any sense, because the determinant is always zero. Finally, look at the power of n, of, of lambda. If the number of flavors is bigger than the number of colors, the exponent here is negative, which means that this superpotential, which is the only expression we can write down, has lambda raised to a negative power. That's inconsistent with our rule number three, called the first rule was holomorphy, the second rule was symmetries, and rule number three, check various asymptotic behavior. Weak coupling limit is big lambda goes to zero. You can check this expression and say weak coupling is g going to zero, and that takes lambda to zero. So in the weak coupling approximation, lambda goes to zero. This is like lambda QCD is infinitesimal, and at that point, whatever non-perturbative physics gives you cannot diverge. So this very simple argument tells you that we cannot have negative powers of lambda in W. And therefore, in this, all these cases, we learn that W effective equals zero. You could, but we are asking ourselves the following question. We have some vacua, set of vacua, say this stage, and we come here to a particular value of m. And we ask, is this still a good ground state in the quantum theory or not? So m is a matrix, 1, 5, 0, and everything else 0, for example. And we ask, is this a good ground state? Well, we should try and, try and write down a superpotential. There is no superpotential we can write down. Since there is no superpotential we can write down, it means that superpotential must be zero. And if it's zero, because you see, it's not just that one thing doesn't work, nothing works. The denominator is zero, the power of lambda is wrong, and so forth. The same thing applies in the case with the adjoint, and that's why in n equals two theories, a quantum modular space of vacua persists. So W effective equals zero, and therefore, we have a quantum modular space, MQ, is the space of exact quantum ground states. Now, I don't know which one you would think is more interesting, the case that a superpotential is generated, 
or the case where a soup potential cannot be generated. And I don't think there's any value judgment. It's not one of them is better than the other. It's some theories do this and some theories do that. If a super potential is generated, we ought to compute it. And we can compute it because it's controlled by our three rules. If the super potential is not generated, the set of questions we ask are different questions. Because now that the super potential cannot be generated, we can ask ourselves, what is the physics at various, in various points in the moduli space? So the first, the easy aspect of the problem is let's go very, very far out. As we go far out along the moduli space, classical physics is a good guide, as I've already said before. And the physics there is the physics of the, is the classical physics. So in the n equals 2 theory, you go a little far out along the moduli space. This was a going to infinity or u going to infinity. And you can work out the metric on the moduli space. The one loop approximation. You can work out the spectrum of BPS particles. You can even work out the spectrum of non BPS particles. The answer will not be exact, but it will be approximately correct. So, this is the first kind of question. That's the easy, and you have to do it before you march to the origin of modular space where things are much more interesting. So, in this set of theories, where there is a modular space of vacua, the interesting question is not that, because the potential vanishes. Here, the physics is approximately classical. So the classical approximation is good. But it becomes worse and worse as we march toward the origin. And the big interesting question is what happens here at strong coupling. And this is where we can find new phenomena. So in the n equals 2 theory, we found massless magnetic monopoles. And if the monopoles condense, has anybody described the fact that when these monopoles condense, they lead to confinement? Has anybody mentioned it in this school? He, 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 he mentioned it? OK. So this is an example. But we can ask what happens here. And it turns out that as you scan the different theories, Already in this theory, you change the number of flavors. You tune the number of flavors up and down. Or in other theories, you can change the gauge group. You can change the matter content. And if you went to Gaiotto's talk yesterday in the morning and the another one in the afternoon, you could see a whole zoo of other theories doing all sorts of marvelous things. And all these marvelous things are things which happen near the origin of moduli space. Yes? That's not a good question. Not, not in the sense, the question that you asked is an excellent question, but physics-wise, that's not a good question. We cannot precisely say what happens near the origin, because we cannot put the system there. <coughs> the potential, this potential diverges there. The subpotential diverges there. The theory is very strongly coupled, and it's very far from the ground state. Well, the, you cannot put the system there. So you shouldn't ask questions which don't have a well-defined answer. You can do that if, well, we'll not continue this sentence. So what happens near the origin? So there's another tool at our disposal, which we'll use now. Another question? Well, that, uh, this was not, no longer the picture, so erase this. This is the case where there is no potential. The potential vanishes. OK, but in the previous case, yes? uh, when uh, you have such picture, so what is M? M is like some component of matrix M? Or? Well, it's, I can write a formula for the matrices. So this is a typical if all components are large. Oh, when all components are large. But in fact, even if some are large, but the others are small, they're very slim. There's a formula. This is a potential of which is a function of several variables. And, you can, and there's explicit formula for it. And you can take various limits and, and explore it. So it's some generic behavior on all components of it. Yeah. So we'll now introduce another knob we can turn, which is the number of flavors, and give some of the intuition behind what the theory really does. <coughs> 
So we started our discussion in the theory with no flavors at all. This was the pure gauge theory. And there the physics was gauging condensation. There was no modular space of vacua and so forth. Now we'll go to the other extreme. Imagine that the number of flavors is larger or equal three times the number of colors. Now the beta function has, quote unquote, the wrong sign. It's a lot like electrodynamics, QED. The theory is IR free. Strictly speaking, as a quantum field theory, it's not well defined. It becomes strongly coupled in the UV. There is a Landau pole. And I hope all of you learned what a Landau pole means. It means that we cannot rigorously define the theory non-perturbatively, but without providing more information about what happens at short distance. But what we can do is go to the infrared. And in the infrared, QED is an excellent theory, which agrees with experiment the huge number of digits, despite the fact that it's not rigorously well defined. The same thing is true here. And in fact, in this case, where the mass of the quark is zero, the coupling constant goes to zero in the infrared, and the approximation of dropping some terms, but performing, say, perturbation expansion or even the leading non-perturbative effect, this approximation becomes better and better as we approach the infrared. So for physics at extremely long distances, we know everything about this theory. And IR mean, free means that an observer at very long distances tells that this is a theory of NC colors and NF flavors. And these quarks and gluons interact with each other very, very weakly. And the interaction becomes weaker and weaker as we go to longer and longer distances. This is a very boring so solution, but it is the correct solution. In other words, you put some particles in the Lagrangian put some interactions in the Lagrangian. And what you see at long distance is precisely what you put in. What you put in is what you got out. What happens is we crank the number of flavors smaller. So imagine the number of flavors is less than, but approximately equal to three times the number of colors. So we can draw the beta function as a function of g. The beta function starts negative, because the beta function has 3nc minus an f. It's negative. So the coupling constant, as we go to the infrared, sorry, so the beta function is negative. As we go to the infrared, g becomes larger. At that point, the two-loop beta function kicks in. The two-loop beta function has always positive sign. So it can turn the running. And depending on the number of flavors and colors, especially if it's very close to the three times the number of colors, we find a non-trivial zero of the beta function. Is this big enough? I'll draw it bigger. So this is the beta function. And the coupling constant runs like that. And it also runs like that. And this is an attractive fixed point. This is an IR fixed point. And this very complicated nonlinear quantum field theory flows in the infrared. So this was the first case. And now we're doing the second case. And this point is an interacting superconformal field theory. This it also comes under the name of banks sachs fixed point. And there's huge literature about superconformal field theories in two dimensions. So some of you learned it in the context of the world sheet of string theory. And there's a smaller but equally interesting literature on four-dimensional conformal field theory. And maybe you learned some of that in the context of n equals four superconformal field theories or from Gaiotto in the context of n equals two superconformal field theories, various superconformal fixed points. This is an example. This is, these are tons of examples, gazillions of them, in n equals one supersymmetry. So this is what happens when the number of flavors is very large. But let's try and crank the number of flavors down. So when the number of flavors is very, very large, the theory in the infrared is free, so g is 0. And then, as we go down in the number of flavors, the fixed point moves to the right, 
and the theory becomes more and more strongly coupled, and the classical approximation is less and less accurate. So the question, is, the most interesting question here, is what happens if we keep going down and this fixed point becomes very, very strongly coupled? What happens there? And in the last 10 minutes, I'll tell you the punchline. When the number of flavors is less than three times the number of colors, but bigger than, to be precise, NC plus one, our SUNC theory with NF flavors is dual to another theory, which has another gauge group. It has NF quarks, which I'll denote by Q and Q tilde. So I'll denote these by times. And a meson M, which is NF by NF matrix, which is essentially the same meson we had before. And there is a superpotential, W, which is roughly Q tilde Q M. So these are two, and I emphasize, cannot overemphasize it, these are two different gauge theories. They have two different gauge groups, two different matter content. Classically, they are as different as possible, almost as different as possible. Yet the claim is that these two theories are completely equivalent quantum mechanically at long distance. Very much like the n equals four theory at tau and at minus one over tau are exactly the same at all distances. And various dualities that Gaiotto presented in n equals two, which relate to different superconformal theories are equivalent at all distances. In the same class of dualities, this is another example, which is somewhat similar to the solution to n equals two theories, which Witten presented. In his solution, we started a short distance from an SU2 gauge theory with quarks and gluons. The quarks were in the adjoint. And at long distance, you have an abelian gauge theory with charged particles. These par charged particles are monopoles with respect to the original theory, but a long, low energy observer doesn't even know these are monopoles. The low energy observer says, we have a photon, and we have some charged particles under that photon. So the pho that photon with that charged particle is dual in the same sense that duality in this theory as these two different gauge groups. And the words associated with this duality are different depending on the number of colors and flavors. So I'll state the answer and then I'll make some comments and then we'll go to lunch. If the number of flavors is less than three times the number of colors, but bigger than three half times the number of colors. So in this range, the picture we presented here is basically correct. The theory starts at short distance, this one. We refer to this theory as the electric one, and this is the magnetic one. The electric theory is UV free. It started at some point and flows under renormalization group to this point. So this is the electric theory in the UV. The magnetic theory is a different gauge group. It's a different theory. It's not the same point. We'll call it magnetic. And this is the UV theory. And even though these two theories are different, they flow in the infrared to exactly the same fixed point. So we have two different UV theories which flow to the same IR fixed point. That by itself is not that shocking. This is known as universality in, various, in condensed matter physics or statistical mechanics. We have many different UV fixed points which can flow to the same IR fixed point. However, I don't have time to explain it here in detail, but as, the as we crank the number of flavors down, the electric theory becomes more and more strongly coupled. In the magnetic description, and if you just plot the same thing, 
you will see that the magnetic theory becomes more and more weakly coupled. Until eventually, when the number of flavors, where is this stick, comes to the bottom of that, what is known as the conformal window. This window is known as the conformal window because the theory flows to a conformal fixed point for this number of flavors and colors. Such that at the bottom of this window, the renormalization group flow is different. So if the number of flavors is bigger than the number of colors plus one, then equal three to half the number of colors. The electric theory is still UV free. And it flows at long distance. Very much like in this blackboard, this fixed point moves further out and it basically reaches infinity. The magnetic theory, on the other hand, and this is a very straightforward one loop computation you can do in this theory. The magnetic theory is IR free. So this is very similar to the situation in N equals two. At short distance, we have SU2 with an adjoint. At long distance, you have a U1 with a charged particle. And we have renormalization group flow from one fixed point to the other. This situation, in my view, is the most interesting phase. It's the most interesting phase in the theory for many different reasons. Number one, what are we expected to do in a quantum field theory? The same thing we're expected to do in most condensed matter systems. We formulate the problem at short distance. In the condensed matter physics, we say we have some atoms and some interactions between them, and we throw them in the box, and we shake it, and we tune the temperature and the magnetic field. And the question is, what pops out? And if we're lucky, something interesting pops out. There could be a superconductor. There could be a superfluid. There could be a ferromagnet. Many things can come out. So statistical mechanics is starting at short distance with a well-posed problem and answering what happens at long distance. Here is an example from particle physics. You start at short distance from quark and gluons, and if we didn't have experiment, probably would have never guessed that what comes out at long distance is massless pions. We start from quarks and gluons at short distance, and we end up with massless gluons. In this theory, we see exactly that. At long distance, we see a free field theory, but the free field theory has nothing to do with the short distance degrees of freedom. The short distance degrees of freedom are the quarks and the gluons of the electric theory. The long distance degrees of freedom are these guys. These guys are not a subset of these. In fact, if you try to write these in terms of these, you will have to write non-local objects. The example of n equals two is similar, but a little bit simpler, because the same massless monopole that you see at long distance, you can see some trace of it at short, at, sorry, the same massless monopole that you see at long distance, you can see a trace of it, or a precursor of it, at short distance. And the precursor is going out along the moduli space and using the classical physics to identify a big, heavy object which will eventually become the massless monopole. Here, these guys, these magnetic quarks, these magnetic gluons, cannot even be found in any approximation in the short distance theory. They are completely new. So what is this theory? We start at short distance with the electric quarks and gluons, and we end up at long distance with the magnetic quarks and gluons, and they are free, and that's the answer. So this is the question. And this is the answer. So this is the notion of this duality. And it exhibits what at the time was extremely surprising. Because what we see at long distance is an SU NF minus NC gauge theory. And that ga this gauge group has nothing to do with that one. So let's review what happens in N equals two. In N equals two, we started with SU two. The SU two 
was spontaneously broken to U1. The U1 is like Maxwell's theory, and Maxwell's theory can be dualized. So the magnetic photon that you see at long distance is a cousin of the electric photon, and the electric photon could be seen at short distance. So we could live with that. Here, it's different. These gluons have nothing to do with these guys. And there is no way of writing them in terms of these degrees of freedom. So where did this gauge symmetry come from? It was not there at short distance. But it is there at long distance. This gives a very vivid example to a point that Nima emphasized at least a dozen times in his talk. Gauge symmetry is not a symmetry. Therefore, it can appear and disappear. Gauge symmetry is a redundancy in our description of physics. And here we have two different redundant descriptions. One redundancy here and another redundancy here. There is no description that we know of of the physics without this redundancy. Yet, the redundant description is redundant, but it's very useful because it gives us a way of writing a Lagrangian, localities manifest, and so forth. But we see that we can get massless composite gauge fields. So we can end up with massless composite gauge fields, gauge fields which look like they come out of nowhere. They come out of the dynamics. Another version of the same problem can be seen in ADS-CFT. There, we have a duality, again, two dual descriptions, with two different redundancies. In one description, we have an N equals 4 gauge theory, or a cascade gauge theory, or any one of the long list of examples, where the redundancy is a field theory redundancy. They have some gauge theory, and the redundancy is the redundancy of that gauge theory. In the gravity side, we have gravitons and general covariance. And what is this general covariance? Well, that's the redundancy in the other description. So we have two redundant descriptions. One of them has ordinary gauge symmetry. Symmetry should not be used here, but traditionally we call it symmetry. On one side of the duality, we have ordinary gauge symmetry redundancy. And on the other side of the duality, we have general covariance as the redundancy. You can ask, which one is more fundamental? Well, we can start easy. Which one is more fundamental, this one and that one? Well, that depends on the way you think about it. You can ask in the, S, in the n equals 4 theories, which one is more fundamental, the description at tau or the description at minus 1 over tau? Well, there it's clear that none of them is more fundamental than the other. In the case of renormalization group flow is here, you could say that this is the fundamental one in the sense that it exists at short distance. And this is the emergent one because it appears at long distance. And the word emergent is the correct word to use here. In ADS-CFT, which one is more fundamental? The n equals 4 gauge theory or the general covariance in the bulk? And the answer is they are equally fundamental. Or maybe more precisely, neither of them is fundamental. So I have planned to say a few more things, but I think this would be a nice place to stop. We've learned a lot about supersymmetry. We've seen that a lot of things can be calculated. I think the most dramatic phenomenon that comes out of it is duality with its various aspects, ranging from gauge theory duality to gauge gravity, string duality that the Beckers describe, going all the way to ADS-CFT, where we have gauge gravity duality. And my experience base, I think I'm the oldest, I'm almost the oldest speaker here. So I should say that my view is that there are many more surprises down the road in this thing, and you're very fortunate to be here in such an exciting time. So I'll stop here. Thank you.